Hampshire Archives and Local Studies welcomes pre-arranged visits by schools, colleges and universities. Uh, wherever possible we will try and tailor the workshops to the school's locality or their curriculum needs. We are also an Arts Award supporter and we welcome those who are undertaking their Bronze or Silver Arts Award. We've got almost a thousand years of history of Hampshire and Hampshire people and that ranges from uh, medieval knights to Tudor barons through to Jane Austen, Florence Nightingale right through to the two world wars and indeed right up to the present day. Much of what we have is in manuscript form or if it's a film or a sound archive then it will be in its original format and I think it's that uniqueness it's the kind of thing that you don't get from a library book. Library books contain a distillation of all of the facts and figures that you find in the archives but in the archive itself you've got that raw material. We are able to run a number of large projects with schools usually uh, by means of external funding and we also like to work with schools to look at uh, particular commemorations um, such as the First and Second World War. Over the years we've worked with a number of creative practitioners including writers, artists and filmmakers. One of the people that we've worked with is Brian Evans-Jones, a poet who worked with us uh, looking at homelessness in Andover. I used several documents which um, gave mostly sort of legal or, or workhouse record information about what was often called vagrancy at the time. From those few seeds, um, of course, it's natural for the human mind to start to create personalities and characters and histories um, and reasons to go with those, those bare facts. To stimulate ideas and get um, creativity flowing, I use quite a range of different things. For younger students, younger pupils in schools, um, that they, I like, if I can, to use objects, to use things that they can manipulate in lots of different ways and just get in touch with um, in as many different ways as possible. Then the next level is, is uh, documents, things written, which um, is very often other poems, but not always, and pictures, um, because those are often very good for stimulating creativity for, for all ages, um, not just school pupils. And finally, of course, the, the pupils' own experiences and imaginations. I made particular use of photographs for a workshop in Gosport um, a year or so ago, where there was an exhibition on in the town of photographs of Gosport taken over a hundred year period. So I got hold of some of those and showed them to the, the kids who'd come along and discussed the places that they recognised and but were, were different of course back in 1900 um, or thereabouts and so we had a, a long discussion about um, what had changed, what might have been improved, what, what they might have lost, things that stimulated their curiosity and mine of course because I didn't know, I don't know Gosport all that well so we had to guess what some buildings were so it was a really good tool for thinking not only about the history of where they lived but um, also about how to engage with that in a, a, a way that was curious and personal and started to use imagination and, and creativity. Another person that we have worked with is Heather Butler who is a local artist and she was able to help a primary school to reinterpret something called the Wellow Album. My impression when seeing the album first of all is I was stunned by the, the detail and, and the, the jewel-like um, beauty really of these sketches and which are very tiny. The artist used an exceedingly sharp pencil and, and drew in a way that people aren't really taught to draw anymore. Um, they look very like etchings because they were, they, they were so, the line was so tiny and so, so precise. We looked at how the pictures had been made up in terms of um, foreground, middle ground, background and and, uh, uh, and how she laid it out as in terms of composition 
Um, and we tried as much as possible to sort of emulate the style and, and materials uh, using using the pencil very sharp and um, uh, using the pencil in a sort of chisel like way as well which is what the artist used on the trees. We used watercolours which um, surprisingly the children hadn't really used before so it was quite nice to be working in a different way than what they were used to. We were working you know, small, we were working with uh, pencils and watercolours in a way that they hadn't used before. Whereas I think often in, in primary schools they're using poster style paints, they're working sort of big and bold, which is of course great, you know, and, and a really good thing to be doing with children, but it's nice to sort of take it the other way and, and, and uh, take a step back and, and do something a little bit different. I think it makes a big difference if you get a specialist to come in uh, to kickstart things, to um, spread a little bit of knowledge and expertise that the teachers can then sort of take on and use later, to show them how some of the materials they've got in their classroom can, can be used. I, I think sometimes they'll have a lovely pile of palettes and paints and printing equipment that will just sit there and, and, and be daunting. Um, so I think it makes a huge difference if you can get a, a, a creative practitioner to come in and, and, uh, and help. We've worked with a number of storytellers and creative writers over the years and one person in particular that we have worked with very closely is Judy Waits who is a, a children's author. I think there's an innate need to storytell in all of us and we all have the ability to do that but sometimes I think for children the actual fact that we're going to sit down and write something now can be a bit of a turn off and it feels like a job to do so try and take away the whole sort of jobness of it and give them the sense that we're doing something exciting you're creating a character you are bringing something new that didn't exist before and this person belongs to you or this idea belongs to you and now what can you do with it? Where do you want to go with it? And I do that through, sometimes through art, through um, little drawings, maybe paintings, things like that, talking about something visual, particularly if children are reluctant readers or reluctant to kind of learn in that more traditional way. Um, also role playing, creating characters and becoming characters and getting under the skin of who it is they're creating. And suddenly then, because they've connected so well with the idea, they do actually want to write it and quite often I find that the most reluctant writers are the most excited about those sorts of techniques because it's perhaps the first time they've thought that they can actually do this and they've got a story to tell. Completely archives have a place in that, that format partly because they already carry such a lot of energy, there's so much history, there's so much story in them already for all the years that they've been around. I've had a student in the past actually who was almost in tears after the session here because she said, I didn't know we could touch this stuff. I didn't know we could, you know, she thought it was all going to be in glass boxes, she thought everything was going to be locked away, she thought there was going to be signs on everything. The fact that we could have all this lovely, <coughs> excuse me, material out that you could actually not exactly rummage through but you could be hands-on with it and actually hands-on with the history and the, all the stories that went with that. Um, I've also got, I've got this most beautiful book in front of me which um, just to hold something like that you know I just think that there's something magical about that in itself the way the pages look the way the writing is how beautiful it is how how um how much time and integrity has gone into it but also the sort of the story behind this of the person who sat and wrote everything by hand in that beautiful writing which was actually at the time of the plague he has actually woven in amongst the writing these extraordinary symbols of little dragons and birds and creatures and fish all sorts of things in amongst the writing so there's two stories here for me there's the story of who wrote this and what was going on at the time with that black death being in the background and what was he doing with all these clues and what was it like for him and his position in that time and place and you could use that to get under the skin of that character. You could do some research into the history of the time. And the, the trouble with research is it sounds such a sort of dry, dead thing to do, but it's actually just like pressing a button on the imagination. It can open up so much. So finding out about the time can help you to find out about him and what he might have done and why he might have done what he did. And then obviously then create the story 
around that that your imagination then runs with you know why are there dragons here what if you had a story of you know you start writing something with your pen now he would have been writing I presume with a quill for, for this um, so with his quill there's his quill and he's starting to write but the writing's turning into a dragon now the dragon's coming out of the page and what's going to happen the connection between him and the dragon or does he get left behind and we go into the story of the dragon that the dragon's almost kind of lifted the story up and taken us somewhere into a fantasy that would be one example of why how i would use material actually within this you know within the archives itself actually something that we could use and take to, to pupils or students another person that we have worked with is david ellery from viewpoint productions uh, david is a filmmaker and we've worked with him on several projects including teaching young people the skills of filmmaking when putting a film together it's all about teamwork and this is where utilising archive, making a film, can draw lots of different people together who've got lots of different skills and it might be that they don't actually know their skills until they start working on a project like this. One of the things that we, we often find is that teachers are a bit reluctant to get involved in something as technical as filmmaking. In reality it isn't nearly as frightening as it seems. It can actually be very very simple technology and so it's, it's really worth just having a look at what's involved and not being put off by the fact that it, that it sounds as if it's going to be a real challenge. If you have a project and you know you want some film footage, I think the first stop is to contact the Wessex Film and Sound Archive, which are based at the Hampshire Record Office in Winchester. Talk to the archivist there. And let's say, for example, you've got uh, a project about your town and then the next step is to get that on a viewable format, which normally is a DVD. You can take that back to the classroom, look through it and decide which bits you want to use and go from there. We can provide copies of material for school use, which might be in the form of a photocopy or indeed a digital copy. But the best way is for pupils to be able to come here to the record office and to actually have a hands-on experience where they can touch see, smell the documents, some of which are several hundred years old, and there isn't anything really to beat seeing the original document. And we can provide visits for schools, they can see behind the scenes, so we can take them to our conservation unit, or we can take them to our sound and film unit to see how we preserve and copy material and they get a look behind the scenes before having that hands-on experience of being able to to look at the original documents and to handle them and uh, to get the thrill of being able to say they've they've seen they've touched something that is several hundred years old